Sometimes I'm worried about what clothes y'all going to have on your back. Or I'm worried about what food are you going to eat. And she says, and, and the only way I can get out of bed some mornings is to turn this record player on and play this song. Like, like I'm, I'm something special. And, and you know, there's a, there's a beautiful thing in that God requires us to remain humble. And so that, um, so a lot of times, you well not a lot of times, but often you've seen me actually preach from down here. And it's not anything special, it's just that maybe the word has worked to me a certain way. And sometimes I just want to be close to you. I always imagine a time where I could like sit in the pews and just talk the word. I know that sounds weird because that's not preaching the word, but I believe that that's how it, it can be given, it can be received in a powerful way. As you may have guessed, the word today, um, as I always give my services, um, a, a, um, a title, it's called Peace Be Still. So can you shut that door? Can you shut the door? I can, it's blinding me. It's called Peace Be Still. And the unique thing about this, that's one. The unique thing about this is that um, I wrote this sermon about four times last night. And the reason I wrote it multiple times is because every time I got a point across, something changed. The media changed. And the whole purpose of the sermon, even though it had a, another intent, was to talk about something that we're all dealing with right now, which is the issues with the coronavirus. The other day I got a call from someone asking me the status of this church, Northeast Assembly of God, with respect to the coronavirus, um, you know, the actual disease is called COVID-19 disease. And they gave me reasons, a list of reasons why we probably should shut down the church um, for the sake of the virus. And my mind began to wander back to Monday that just passed. Um, as y'all know, I, I'm really into bodybuilding. One of my favorite bodybuilding shows were canceled because of the coronavirus in Ohio. And even though there was uh, not a single death in Ohio up to this point, up to last night when I wrote this, um, they had decided that they were going to um, pronounce or declare Ohio in a state of emergency. On Monday, I don't know if you're into basketball, but there's a center for the Utah Jazz called Rudy Gilbert, who recently tested positive for the coronavirus. And in an interview with one of the media people, he jokingly said that he had licked the mics of all the media in, at the media table. On Thursday, Another member of his his uh, team was found to be positive for the coronavirus. Today, the NBA, the NHL, the MSL, and Major League Baseball have either suspended their season or postponed their season because of the coronavirus. Many states have put bans on large gatherings of people so that sporting events and large group participation activities are all being canceled. In some states, if your church has more than 500 members, the government is requiring you to either cancel worship or to find another means. Major office buildings are closing, stores are closing, government agencies are, if they're least possible, closing or requiring that their, that their employees do telemarketing. In Pennsylvania alone, there's a suggestion that if you have over a thousand people in your gathering, that you don't gather. This is, suggestion has crippled some people in some events and in some businesses. 
and has also allowed local governments to impose even stricter requirements. All the schools in Montgomery County closed Tuesday. 63 schools in Philadelphia <coughs> County closed Thursday, and my son brought to my attention that Friday, the rest of the schools closed as well. And we live in a country where there are 40 million people, 40 million people, and to this date, today, and that was about two o'clock this morning, we've only got recorded 41 cases of the coronavirus. 41 cases of the coronavirus. Yesterday while I was listening to uh, sports, Delaware County CDC came on and outright suggested that all churches stop worship. It was a suggestion, they didn't mandate it. The world would suggest that we who love God, the God of our creation, stop worshiping him for fear of sickness. And many of you see my confusion here. Because being a man of God, I believe the only solution to this problem is God. <coughs> and they're asking us to stop worshiping the very one who can heal that. The scripture calls him Jehovah Rapha. The God who heals. And if we're in a situation like this, I'm not sure, but if I'm going to call on something, before I call on the CDC, I'm going to call on Jehovah Rapha. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. And so what I want to talk about today, if I can, is three intelligent ways that Christians, without us being some kind of weird sort of society, that Christians can deal with the coronavirus. I want to talk about how Christians should respond to the coronavirus ep epidemic. The second thing I want to talk about is how Christians should discern the times in light of the coronavirus. And the third thing I want to talk about is how Christians should express their faith in light of the coronavirus. Let's talk about the first thing. Second Timothy 1 and 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power and love and sound judgment. Now let's break down this passage for you if I can. There are four things that are identified in that passage. The first thing is fear. The second thing is power. The third is love. And the fourth is judgment. I'm not going to talk about fear. I'm not going to talk about power right now. But what I want to address right now is love and judgment. Even though the Bible never speaks of the coronavirus, we can go to history to see how God expects Christians to behave in light of a situation. Here's a short history class for you. In the late second century, Rome broke out a, a pandemic called the Antonine Plague. That plague is said to have killed five million people in Rome. In the third century, there was another plague uh, that broke out called the Cyperian Plague. That plague lasted 20 years. And it was once said that that plague was killing up to 5,000 people a day. But during these plagues, while Rome was fearfully separating the sick from the rest of society, Christians were caring for them. While Rome soothsayers and, and high priests were teaching that the plague was the result of the angry God, Christians was teaching that the plague was a result of a fallen world. A century later, Emperor Julian complained bitterly how that the Galileans, the Christians, would care for even the non-Christian sick people while the Romans failed to care for anyone but themselves. Christians were at the ground zero meeting, the needs of the Romans, the needs of the Christians, and all those who were sick at that time. In 1527, the bubonic plague or the black plague hit Europe. 
The story is that Martin Luther refused to leave Wittenberg, Germany because he said his responsibility was to the people there. Bishop Siberian, who the second plague I mentioned was named after, I, I, I need you to understand, he wasn't, it wasn't named after him because he had the plague. It was named after him because he preached on the plague. And one of the things he preached is that a Christian should respond to the plague in such a way that we should not care so much about what is going to happen in our lives as we double and triple our efforts in bringing those souls to Jesus Christ. Now, I know this is a hard thing to get because everybody says, I love Jesus, until someone says, get in the trenches. Hmm. Everybody says, I love Jesus, until somebody says, now you need to walk that walk. But the true Christian way throughout history has been when plagues and epidem epidemics have happened, Christians have taken on the call. Sociologist Rodney Shark says, not only were the, the deaths in the places of Rome half of what they were in societies where there were Christian communities, in those places in Rome where there were Christian communities, the deaths were half as many. He said, but something else happened. The people who converted to Christianity tripled and quadrupled. You see, one thing that Christians get wrong is it is in our suffering that God proves himself. What I'm saying is that for many of us, rather than run in fear like the rest of the world is, afraid of this coronavirus, maybe, I'm not sure, but maybe God has given us an opportunity to reach people that we would not have normally reached for his gospel. Amen. Mm -hmm. Second thing I want to talk about is sound judgment. Second Timothy says he's given us a spirit of love and sound judgment. Sound judgment tells us that even though we have faith that God will protect us from this virus. It is a virus. And today, unlike back then, Christians don't have to meet the needs of the people. We have medical professionals that do that. But God still wants us to have sound judgment. What he's saying is, if the situation should arise, if the situation should arise whereby you are near someone who has the virus or you're in a situation where you might the virus you might become susceptible to the virus he's saying use sound judgment wash your hands wear gloves wear a mask the scripture says you should not tempt the Lord your God mm -hmm. you know what it takes sound judgment If we use this sound judgment, then we can do something unique. We can minister to the sick in locations where we may become sick ourselves and both maintain God's agenda, which is to give him glory, to bless others, and to expand his kingdom. And we can be confident knowing that because we have love and sound judgment, God is going to take care of the rest. Amen. The second thing I want to say is how should Christians discern the times in, in light of this coronavirus? Matthew 4, 8-11 through 11 says again the devil took him we're talking about Jesus Christ to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, I give you all these things if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus told him, go away, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him and the angels came and ministered to Jesus. 
Whenever a Christian pastor speaks about the supernatural, the first thing that comes into the mind of the general public is either he's crazy or he's paranoid. I can assure you, I am not paranoid. He's using, they'll say things like he's using the spiritual things to justify his skewed view of reality. <clears throat> but for those of us that believe that Satan is real, that we know that the Bible does not speak very kindly of him. The Bible calls him the tempter. The Bible calls him the father of lies, the evil ones. But the name I want you to pay attention to right now is in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. It says, he's the God of this age. And as being the God of his age, the one thing the devil wants more than anything else is to be worshipped. We read in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it says, he said, I want to be just like God. I want, to, I want to measure up with God. And so that the worship that God gets, he wants. And what we need to know is Satan will do anything in his power to get his worship and take God from worship. Take the worship from God. In fact, we know from the scripture that Satan tried to tempt Jesus to worship him. So I hear people say he'll never tempt me. He don't tempt us to worship him by telling us, come worship me on a high mountain. He tells us as if you if you do this, I can give you that. Or I'll meet this need, or I'll make this bit of life a little bit easier for you. And one of the ways he can do this is to draw us from the normal worship for fear of of congregating together. I know a lot of you are going to say, but everyone are making the changes. Every church is making a change to just cancel service or to do service another way. Why aren't you doing it? But I want you to consider this. With the coronavirus bans, and specifically, I don't know if you paid attention, the bans against churches. There is, a, there is an outward suggestion that we stop worship. And what we need to do is know that the scripture says we wrestle not with flesh and blood. I know a lot of people are saying, wait a minute, but the government and the CDC and the high-ranking people have said this is what we should do. And I'm telling you, maybe behind all this, Is something supernatural. Yeah. Lastly, there are some of you that will say, well, maybe I can hear it and stream it online. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a time that by streaming it online, we have some benefits. Some real benefits. If you're sick and you can't get to church, maybe you can't, you need it streamed online. Maybe a situation is you're in another town and you want to hear the word of your pastor, streaming it online, it has a lot of benefits. But it's not the same as coming here. That's right. How do I know? <clears throat> Matthews 18, 20 says, where two or three or more gathered in my name. It never says, where two or three are online in my name. <laughs> it doesn't say that. It says, they're gathered together in my name. Hebrews tell us that we should never forsake the gathering of the saints. This is because God puts value in physical fellowship. In fact, God puts so much value in physical fellowship that he's called it a means of grace. In Acts 2, we hear about the means of grace. He says, one of the means of grace, one of the things that sets us in the right position in order to be blessed by God is fellowship. Right along with prayer, right along with studying your word, right along with the sacraments, is fellowship. God says if you get those four things right, I can you can put yourself in a position to be blessed. Fellowship. 
But if we listen to the world, then we stop the fellowship. Y'all are the rest. Hebrews 10, 23 and 25 says, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. And let us watch out for one another and provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some has the habit of doing, but encouraging each other all the more as you see the day approaching. How Christians should express faith in light of uh, coronavirus. Three times since yesterday, I had to update my information on this coronavirus. Three times since yesterday. I had to update my information on the coronavirus because every few minutes, the media was giving us a new update. As a matter of fact, as I said, my, my 14 year old son even gave me an update on the coronavirus. What we know right now is France and Spain has implemented a nationwide lockdown. The U.S. has banned travel from Europe. Sporting events have stopped. Businesses have closed. Churches have given up worshiping the God of their creation. Schools have shut down and people are afraid to go outside. And on top of all this, scientists that are supposed to fix this mess that we're in are saying, they don't know, maybe it'll get worse. And we have to admit, whether we want it or not, that no matter how much you believe, sometimes this can overwhelm you. It can cause you to worry. It can cause you to be anxious and afraid. Fearful about what the future holds for me. Will, will I get this virus? Will, will, it, will, it, will it affect a family member? Will it affect a friend? But in Matthew 6, Jesus tells us three times, don't you worry. And he gives us the assurance that God knows what's going on. It ain't catching by surprise. In Matthew 6, 25, Jesus says, don't worry about your life because God knows what's going on. Amen. In Matthew 31, he says, don't worry about your needs because God knows what's going on. In Matthew 34, he says, Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow, because God knows what's going on. Amen. This didn't catch God by surprise, even though it may have caught the doctors by surprise. And the reason Jesus gives that we should never worry is first, because our Heavenly Father knows what we have need of. Right. Jesus says God is taking care of the lesser things, the birds of the skies and the lilies of the fields. What makes you think he won't take care of you? Yeah. And the second reason Jesus says he, that we shouldn't worry is because this is how the rest of the world behaves. He says we are a peculiar people. We are God's masterpiece. We're set apart for his glory. And we don't act like the rest of the world. So the scriptures is telling us to be cautious about this coronavirus, make intelligent and sound judgments to mitigate getting sick when necessary, but not to the point where we're worried, where we're anxious, we're afraid of going outside, and we're afraid of fellowshipping with the saints. Throughout history, troubles have come to Christians. Whether it be persecution, whether it be natural disasters, whether it's financial difficulties, Christians have not turned away from worship when these things have come. If anything, when the troubles come, Christians have doubled up on the worship. My cousin used to say, sometimes when you know things are going to be bad, you got to sit down and pray a little while and get yourself all prayed up before you go out into the valley. What I need to know right now is we got to get all prayed up. We got to get all geared up. We need to put on our full armor. Because God did not call us to have a spirit of fear.
But when Christians get so overwhelmed with the things of this world that they are unable to do the things that God had put them on this world to do, then what they're saying individually or as a group is, I don't believe what Jesus said about the Father is true. What they're doing is admitting a lack of faith. And Hebrews 11.6 tells us, without faith it's impossible to please God. Amen. But the scriptures don't tell us just how to get some faith if you ain't got it. I know it can be sometimes difficult and almost impossible if you ain't got faith to say, well, I'm just going to believe. But if we open up our Bibles to Philippians 4, 6, and 70, it says, don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Jesus Christ. Let me explain this verse. I love this passage. The passage says God will give us a peace in the middle of the chaos of this coronavirus pandemic. Which will not only, will it not make sense to the rest of the world how everybody else is acting a fool, but we're okay. You know what peace is? People think peace is the absence of war, but that's not what peace is. Peace is being able to be calm when everybody else is all messed up. Peace is a bird who sits on his nest relaxed while there's a thunderstorm coming. Peace is the way we act when everything else, everybody else has lost their mind about the situation. God says even though there's a pandemic coming, that if we make our requests known through prayer and petition, he'll give us a peace that surpasses understanding. He didn't say he'll give us our peace that surpasses understanding. He said he'll give us his peace. Now, I know my peace might not be that peaceful. <laughs> All the time. All the time, most of the time. <laughs> but God's peace is real peace. It's supernatural peace. As a matter of fact, I have a prayer for y'all. Along with that verse of Philippians 4, 6 and 7. And I wrote this this morning concerning this. If, for those of you who may have this fear, about the coronavirus. I wrote this as I was writing. It may not be perfect because I was writing as, it, I was, as I was praying. It says, Father, I want to thank you for your son, my Lord Jesus Christ, who said that you know my life and my needs and my fears. And you've got all these things under control. Now, the truth, Father, I've been fearful of this coronavirus and I've allowed the media to put so much fear in me that I've not been able to function my life as I normally would. In fact, God, it has hindered my thinking so much that I've even considered forsaking the gathering of the saints through fellowship and worship, which you have commanded that I do. But I thank you that Jesus Christ has told me that these things will come, that suffering will come, that persecution will come, that fear will come, but all these things will come, but all I have to do is be courageous. He says, because I have victory. Amen. Jesus says, because he's already overcome this world. Amen. I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who's already overcome this world. Amen. Yeah, real simple prayer. What I just did is I gave you a prayer that was first on the thankful stage. It says, make your petition on whatever it is, whatever it is that's worrying you, whatever it is that's, that's that's on your mind, whatever it is that's stopping your sleep at night. God says, don't take it to your best friend. Take it to me. He says, he says, through prayer and petition, make whatever's causing you to worry, your anxieties, make it known to me. And he says, how to do it? With thanksgiving. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for me. So that my sins won't be counted against me. Thank you for, 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 for Philippians 4, 6 and 7, which says that you will give me a peace that goes beyond understanding. 
God saved you. When, when I was a little kid, I, I used to live with my aunt for a long period of time. And my aunt used to play a song by James Cleveland called Peace Be Still. Somebody know I heard y'all say it. Peace Be Still. Every Sunday she would play that song and she got up and she came to the house. And sometime when the song was over, she would just put it, put it on replay. We had one of those and then she would play it over and over and over. And one Sunday, I was a little afraid of my aunt. One Sunday, I got up to heart and I said to her, Aunt Carrie, why do you play that song over and over and over again every morning? And I listened to it every morning. But on Sundays, we got it multiple times. And I thought she was going to hit me, but she didn't. <laughs> She said, boy, let me tell you something. She said, I'm a single mother. And I'm raising five kids. She said, on top of that, I'm raising you. And she had to raise me. Because at that time, my mother would, would, would show up one day and be gone for three, four months at a time. And no one would know where she was. So for, up until I was about eight years old, my aunt raised me. And she said, I'm raising five of my own and I'm raising you. And she said, sometimes I worry about how the bills are going to be paid. And she said, sometimes I worry about my health. She had heart problems and high blood pressure and diabetes. And she wasn't someone that was overweight or eating bad. It was just it's in the family. And she said, sometimes I'm worried about what clothes y'all going to have on your back. Well, I'm worried about what food are you going to eat. And she said, it's in the only way. I can get out of bed some morning is to turn this record player on and play this song. And because God is saying to me, be still and know that I'm God. If you don't have a, a King James Bible, you should open up to the verse we just talked about. If you don't, you can actually look on the back of the, the bulletin. I'm going to read the passage here. It's Mark 4, 3. 37 through 40. I'm not going to read 40. Mark chapter 4, verses 3, uh, verses 37 through 40. It's, it's in the back of the book. It's on the back of the book. It's on the back of the book. And there goes a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. He was in the head of the part of the ship. And they awakened the sail to the master. Care for the master of the church. And he awoke to the sail to the sail. And the wind ceased. And there was a great power. And he said to them, Why are you yet so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? My final word to you today is that. It makes no difference if it's the coronavirus, or if it's a financial problem, or if it's health issues, anxiety, fear, depression, and worry. The winds and the waves. The that God wants in his people. Let's go. So that the scripture is saying, in Shall every, obey your will. every little problem that keeps you awake, that is all you got to, to have the emotions. The scripture is saying, and through supplication with thanksgiving, that Jesus knew what's causing these anxieties. And you know what's going to happen? The he's going to stand up in the midst of your problems. And he's going to speak to your problems and tell you, peace, peace, And when he does, he's going to be